Now, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, he wrote this epistle. He wrote it for a couple of reasons that I want to share with all of you today because those reasons, they are very significant. They are very important for us to know today. The first reason we see there in the third verse, where Jude, he encouraged believers, he said, to contend earnestly for the faith. Contend, fight for the faith is what Jude said there. Now, why was he telling believers there, the believers of his day, why was he telling them to, to fight earnestly for the faith? Where Jude, he tells us there in the fourth verse that there were certain men that had crept in. They had crept into the church. He said there that they had crept in unnoticed. When, when someone creeps in, they aren't doing it with, out of the goodness of their hearts. They are sneaking in. They are sneaking in. They, you know, when a lion, when he sees his prey, when she sees her prey, the lioness creeps in to go unnoticed, to attack, to consume. That's what predators do, aren't they? So again, Judy said that certain men, they had crept in unnoticed to the church. And so because they had crept in unnoticed, they posed a threat. They posed a threat to the church. They posed a threat to those who believed as well. So we need to know who were those certain men? Who were they? How did they creep in unnoticed? And what was the threat? What was the danger that they posed to the church, that they posed to believers? Now, it is very likely that they crept in by saying that they were a believer, by professing that they believed in Christ. However, again there, looking at that fourth verse, Jude, he tells us that these men, that they eventually they turn the grace of God into lewdness, into lasciviousness. If you're looking at the King James translation, Judy tells us that they eventually denied God. They not only denied God, but Jude, he said there that they denied his only begotten son as well. So in other words, those certain men, they abused God's grace. They abuse God's grace to be immoral in their ways, in their actions, in their activities. And they did so proudly. They had no shames in, in their immorality. And so in their sin, in their immorality, we see that they moved away from God. They denied him. And so in moving away from God, after professing to, to believe in him, they became what we call today apostates. Now, an apostate is one who is defined as one who has abandoned a previous loyalty or faith, if you will. So ultimately, we see here that Jude... He wrote this epistle because he did not want the believers of his day. He did not want them to follow the apostate. He did not want them to follow in the way of apostasy. You see, we'll see there. If you take a look at the fifth, the sixth and the seventh verse, we'll see that Jude, he had a, a great amount of understanding of what await those that choose to turn away from God in the same manner as the apostates of his day. We'll see there in the fifth, the sixth and the seventh verse that he first pointed to the children of Israel, who again, we know they were brought out of the bondage of Egypt and they were, they were given the law that they said that they would live by. They said to Moses, Hey, this law from God, it sounds good. We will keep it. But again, after they were brought out of the bondage of Egypt, Jude, he points out that not all of them believed. And those who did not believe, those who turned away from God, Jude, he points out that they were destroyed by God. They were some early apostates, and because they turned away from God, they were destroyed by the Lord. Jude he then pointed there from the fifth through the seventh verse there. 
He then pointed to the angels. Specifically, he points to the ones that followed Satan in his sin. And in following Satan in his sin, Jude, he points out how they are now reserved in everlasting chains, awaiting their destruction. Destructions by God. Apostates, the first of their kind, along with the devil himself. Then we'll see there in that scripture that he pointed to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities that, uh, that was around Sodom and Gomorrah as well. And he points out there that they were set as an example of suffering the vengeance, God's vengeance of eternal fire. Because again, they did not heed the word of God. They turned away from it. As I often say, nobody should desire to face such judgment from the Lord, right? Do you desire to face that kind of judgment from God to be destroyed by the Lord? I don't know about you, but I don't. I don't want to be destroyed by God. I would hope that's the same for you. And I hope that that's the same for all who are beyond these church walls. So again, what does what happened to, to those who are of Israel what does what happened to those who are Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels that follow Satan, the apostates of Judah's day? What does that have to do with us today? Well, we'll see there in my key verses for today, there in the 17th and the 18th verse, specifically, taking a look at the 18th verse, we'll see Jude, he, he refers to the word of the apostles. He spoke about how the apostles said that there would be mockers in the last time, Jude said, who would walk according to their ungodly lust. Now, I am one of those who believe that we are living in the period of the last time. Those days which Paul said would be perilous days. I believe that we are living in those last times, that we are living in those perilous days. And so, because I believe that, I would ask all of you the question, do you believe that those same certain men, do you believe that they still exist today? Do you think that we, the believers, do you think that we, the church, that is, the entire congregation of all of those who sincerely believe in Christ, who follow in his way, do you believe that we face a certain threat from those certain men if they still exist today? Do you think that we face a danger from apostates today? Now, since those certain men had crept in unnoticed, we will see that Jude, he provided for the believers of his day. He provided them with a description so that they could be on the lookout for those certain men, so that they could be on the lookout for the apostates. So what I want us to do here for a moment here is I want us to make a note of Jude's description of the apostates of his day. They have a Bible, Andrew. They can We'll see that in his first description, there in the eighth verse, that Jude, he said that the apostates of his day, that they were dreamers who defiled the flesh. They rejected authority and they spoke evil of dignitaries. Description, the first description that we have from Jude of the apostates of his day. In the 10th verse, we'll see a second description for the believers of his day to be on the lookout for when it came to the apostates. Jude, he said that the apostates, that they spoke evil of whatever they did not know. What they didn't know, they spoke evil of, and Jude said that they corrupted themselves. Then there in the 11th verse, we see a third description of the apostates of Jude's day where Jude, he likened them to Cain, to Balaam, and to Korah. 
Those were rebellious men that we find in Old Testament scripture. Now, let me provide you all with some clarity so that we can understand the three descriptions that we have of the apostates of Jews' day. The apostates, those certain men, they did not live in reality. They didn't live in reality. They didn't live according to the truth. They denied the truth. They ignored the truth for their dreams. They were dreamers. They also lacked honor. They lacked respect for those that were deserving of honor, for those that were deserving of respect. For essentially all people, but specifically Jude, he pointed out the dignitaries. They also, again, they spoke evil of what they were ignorant to. They did not know. They were ignorant to it. Rather than sitting down and learning what they were ignorant to, they chose to, again, Jews say, said there, they chose to speak evil of it. And then to go along with their ignorance in the description of the three rebellious men of the Old Testament, they were selfish, they were envious, they were jealous, they were murderers, they were prideful men that did not love nor care about their neighbors, those that were around them. And so with those descriptions in mind, I again, I will ask you all this question. Do you think those same certain men, do you think that they still exist today? Just look at the descriptions there. Selfish, envious, jealous, prideful, ignorant. Is today's generation a generation of apostates? Therefore, is today's generation a generation of apostasy? When we take a look at the 16th verse, as he considered the quote-unquote last time, which I said I believe is today, Jude, he said the apostate would be grumblers and complainers that walk according to their own lust. Think about it. Grumblers, complainers that walk, that live according to their own lust. Do you think that those same certain men, do you think that they still exist today? I ask you, keep in mind. Jude, he still said there even more in that 16th verse, he said that the apostate of the last time that they will mouth Great swelling words. Uh oh. They will mouth great swelling words, flattering people in order to, to gain advantage, in order to take advantage of them. Again, I ask you do you think those same certain men, those same certain people, do you think that they still exist today? Then again, there in the 18th verse. Second of my key verses, let's keep in mind that Jude said that in the last time, they will be mockers. They will be mockers of the Lord our God. Do you think that they are still around, those certain men, the apostates, do you think that they're still around today? As I have pointed out in recent sermons, today's generation is a generation that is straying further and further away from the Lord. Adultery. This generation is a generation, as I said last Sunday, that is immoral. It is a generation that feeds off of anger. It is a generation that feeds off of bitterness. It is a generation that feeds off of gossip, conspiracies, lies. It is a generation that feeds off of greed. Today's generation is a generation that proudly mocks God. It is a generation that proudly mocks having faith in the Lord. It is a generation that scoffs at the mere idea of godly living. For the sake of living wickedly, for the sake of living sinfully, it rejoices in living sinfully. This generation is one that denies God. 
It denies God and the giving of his only begotten son. Look at today's generation. And again, when I say today's generation, I'm talking about the generation, all people that fill the whole wide world. So while the apostasy of Jews' day was as a tiny cloud, I will tell you that today's apostasy is like a cat for hurricane. We are working our way. We are very close to being a cat five. Of this time, John, he wrote in his first epistle, he said that it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, John said, even now many Antichrists, they have come. They are here. That's what he said in his day. Again, we live in a generation where more people will deny God and his only begotten son than walk faithfully according to the way of his. The apostasy, the apostasy of today is, is filled with the proud blaspheming of the Lord our God by those who are of that spirit of Antichrist. So if you did not know if you could not come up with an answer to my question about whether or not the same certain men still exist today, I would tell you that they do. I would tell you that those same certain men, that they are still here in the world today. The apostates, they are here today, and they pose a very great threat to the believers of today, to those who walk sincerely according to their faith, to those that desire to walk according to faith in Christ they pose, again, a very great threat to the whole world. You see, their goal, it is still the same. It is to turn the grace of God into lewdness, into wickedness, with the desire to pull you, to pull all of us, all of us who believe today, to pull them into their sin. The modern-day apostate will use their flattering words of ignorance to persuade, they use their flattering words of ignorance to corrupt as many who are open to listening, to heeding, and to receiving their messages. How many of us today are falling for the flattering words of the ignorant fool? How many of us today are being fooled by the same certain men that caused many of those who profess to be believers of Jews' day to follow in their way of apostasy. So we must go about trying to overcome this threat, right? We don't want to fall for the words of the flattering fool, do we? We don't want to fall for the words of the apostate today, do we? So how do we do it? How do we... How do we withstand their flattering words? How do we overcome their flattering words? How do we go about withstanding this threat that we face today? The old folks, they would say that this generation needs God. They would see all that's going on today in those old folks that I grew up around. They say, oh, man, y'all need God. That's a, that, they would just leave it simply at that. Y'all need God. And you know what? I would agree with them today. This generation is a generation that needs God. We need God today more than we ever have did. We need the Lord today. We need God today so that we can overcome those certain men. So that we can overcome the threat so that we can overcome the danger, so that we don't fall into their apostasy, so that we don't fall into their sin. So to overcome this threat, we'll see there in the first of my key verses there, the 17th verse, Jude, he encouraged believers there to remember the words. He said, remember, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of Christ. So in other words, 
We are supposed to remember Christ. We are supposed to remember his words. How many of us remember the words of Christ today? How many of us remember the words that were spoken by Christ? How many of us are living by his words? How many of us are living by the word of God today? You see, something that today's generation has gotten away from is the word of God. Today's generation is a generation that does not remember the word of God. In fact, I will tell you that today's generation seems to hardly even know who God is. I ain't going to get no amens on that. That's okay. Today's generation, therefore, is a generation that now lacks knowledge of the Lord, that now lacks knowledge of his word. And because of this lack of knowledge, I tell you that today's generation is a generation that is easily fooled by the flattering words of the ignorant fool. It is a generation that leaves itself wide open to defeat. And I don't know about all of you, but I don't want to be defeated by a fool. Oh, boy. I, I do not want to be defeated by an ignorant fool. You see, we cannot follow the words of a fool, can we? We should not and we cannot follow the words of a fool because as we know, the fool is one who is on a path to destruction. And again, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the path to destruction. Do you want to be on the path to destruction today? That in mind, why are so many people then so adamant on following the flattering lies of the ignorant fool today? Why do so many people today, why do so many people today believe the words the fool shares is wisdom, that it is wise and, and that it is true? You see, I honestly, I don't know why. Because, you see, it doesn't make sense to me to follow the words of a fool. I, I, I cannot make it make sense in my head today why so many people are willingly following fools today. Throughout his many letters, Paul, he warned against the wisdom of the world. And he warned against heeding the wisdom of the world. Paul, he, he realized something. He realized and he wrote about it in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians in the 18th through the 20th verse. If you want to, you can turn over to that scripture for me. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, the 18th through the 20th verse, Paul, he called on nobody deceiving themselves according to their own wisdom. And see, Paul, he realized that the perceived wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. He said that God catches the wise in their own craftiness and knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Paul said that they are futile, that they are useless. You see, God's word, it will save you. It is a, a saving word, but the words of the apostate will only lead to destruction. Paul, he shared his warning, said that those who may be prideful will humble themselves in order to truly become wise. But sadly, the ego and the pride of many has caused them to ignore God. It has caused them to ignore God, and they end up again falling into the same snare of the apostate. We cannot again fall into the same snare of the apostate. We cannot fall out of our faith today. Our faith again today, it must be sincere in our heart. 
And so if we look at, again, the background scripture that is serving as background scripture for all of my sermons today or this for this month, we'll see over in 2 Peter, in the first chapter of 2 Peter and the fifth verse, we will see again where Peter, he encouraged believers with all diligence, with all seriousness to continue to add to their faith, to continue to, to grow in their faith. Peter, he said that with all diligence, we must add to our faith virtue, goodness. That's what we saw in last week's message. And then Peter, he said that with all diligence, we should add to that virtue knowledge. Knowledge, Peter said there. We must gain, we must increase our knowledge of God. We must gain, we must increase our knowledge of his word so that we do not fall into the snare of apostasy. So that we do not fall for the flattering words of the fool. So how do we go about adding knowledge to our faith? How do we go about, think about it today, how do you go about adding knowledge to your faith? Many of us will say, well, pastor, I open up the Bible and I read the Bible. Isn't that what we would say? Yeah, I tell you today that getting to know the Lord, it takes more than just simply opening up your Bible and glancing at scripture. Uh oh. Somebody going to look at me kind of strange now. They're going to say, well, that's what mama and daddy used to do. They used to open up their Bible and they would just read scripture. That's what you thought that they did. They did a little bit more than just open up the Bible and read scripture. Uh-oh. How do we add knowledge to our faith? Uh, I would tell you today that in order for us to know somebody, we should do our best to develop a relationship with them, right? You don't get to know me by simply reading a piece of paper about me, do you? You can't know who I am by just looking me up on the internet. The internet can lie to you. You can't just go to my social media and think that you know who I am. In order for you to get to know me, you have to come to me. You have to ask about me. You have to see what I will say to you. You have to be around me. How do we get to know God? Can we get to know him fully by just simply glancing at scripture? No, we cannot. So the first thing we need to do in order to add to our faith with knowledge of the Lord is that we must develop a relationship with him. We must go to him. We must seek him out. Jesus, he said in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel in the seventh verse, he said, ask. And again, it will be given to you. Seek. Jesus said that you will find if you knock on the doors, it will be open to you. God, he does not hide himself for, from us. The Lord, he wants for us to find him so that we can know him. So you must seek for him if you desire to add knowledge about him to your faith. You must go to him. You must develop a relationship with him. You must come into fellowship with him so that you can get to know who he is so that you can know how he operates, how he moves for you. Have you gone to find the Lord today? For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Don't be afraid to seek God out. Again, Many of us, we are straying further and further away from the Lord and we're leaving ourselves wide open for defeat. I call on you today to return to God, to seek him out, to develop a relationship with him so that you cannot be overcome by the flattering lies of the ignorant fool. 
Uh, the second thing that we must do here today is not simply glance at Scripture. It's not enough for you just to glance at Scripture. You must study God's Word, and you must do so intensely. We must study God's words in all seriousness today. Do you understand what I mean by that? Paul, he wrote that we should be diligent to show ourselves approved, that we should study to show ourselves approved unto the Lord, rightly dividing the word of truth. Deep studying of God's word is what we need today. Not just to simply hear what somebody has to say about God, but then to pour over scripture, to dive into it and to study it. That is why I tell all of you every time that I stand up with a message for you, every verse that I reference, I hope that you can write it down so that you can pour over it later after this message has been preached. I will hope that you will go to newfoundfaith.org and that you will look at the sermon, that you can go over it again in finer details. We, again, in order to add knowledge to our faith, we must study with all seriousness. We cannot take a break from the word of God. That's what many of us do today. We take a break from the word of God. We'll open up the Bible one day a week, and that's on Sunday for the 30 to 45 minutes that the sermon is preached. And then after that, we shut up the Bible, we put it back down on our chairs, and we leave church, and we don't open it up again until the next time we're in church. In our deep studying of God's word, we find a great benefit to our relationship with the Lord. You see, through our fellowship with the Lord, we are able to receive the Holy Spirit. And when we are pouring over scripture, when we are studying scripture, and we may not have a full understanding of what it is that we are studying, Jesus, he shared with us that the Holy Spirit will guide us further into all truth, helping us to understand the word of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all things that Christ said again. Jews said that we should remember the words of Christ in order to overcome the threat that we face from the apostate today. So there are three primary ways here for us to, to add knowledge to our faith in getting to know the Lord. We should enter into fellowship with him. We should get to know him through the Holy Spirit who will guide us further into knowledge of him. And again, we should study the word. We should study God's word in all seriousness today. I hope you got those three in mind. Because again, adding knowledge to your faith, it is of the utmost importance today. Now, some, they may begin to wonder, well, why is it so important that I keep on adding knowledge to my faith? Is what some may begin to wonder. Well, I would ask you, do you know everything that there is to know about the Lord? Do you know everything there is to know about his word? You see, I tell you today that you don't know everything. None of us do. We do not know everything. You see, one who lacks knowledge, they should seek to learn, right? We should always be seeking for, for more wisdom. Seeking for, for more knowledge. We should never stop growing, should we? We should never stop growing in our wisdom. We should never stop growing in our knowledge. When we do that, when we become complacent, when we think that we know everything, we stop growing in our faith. And again, we are leaving ourselves wide open to defeat. This, it presents us with Again, another reason why it is so important that we continue to add knowledge to our faith. You see, the reason being is that our enemy, our adversaries, and those who are his agents, like the apostates, the first thing that they are going to attack when it comes to you is your knowledge. 
That is the first place that Satan and his agents of wickedness will attack you is what you know. Think about it for a moment. Going all the way back to the garden. We spoke about Eve this morning. Satan, his first attack on Eve was her knowledge. Her knowledge of the instructions that was given to her by the Lord. She thought she knew God's instructions, but she didn't know it well enough because Satan took advantage of what she thought she knew. That's what the devil does today. He will always attack what you think you know. But again, when we study his word seriously, when we are led in his word by the Holy Spirit, when we have a relationship with the Lord, our God, we cannot be Food. We cannot be deceived by the flattering lies of the ignorant fool. We cannot be fooled, nor can we be deceived by Satan himself. You see, John, he again wrote in his first epistle, in the fourth chapter and the sixth verse. He wrote that those who come to know the Lord, they will come to know the spirit of truth and the spirit of of error. And do you know the spirit of truth and do you know the spirit of error today? You see, what it means to know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, it is to know what is right. It is to know what is wrong. Not in your eyes, not in somebody else's eyes, but in the eyes of the Lord. Let us not underestimate how powerful this statement is from John to know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, to have knowledge of what is right and what is wrong in the eyes of God. Let us not underestimate how valuable that is for us to have knowledge of. I think about when I was growing up and I think about what my parents what my grandparents, what my uncles, and what my aunts would say about an education. And maybe you all heard the same thing. They would always speak about how important it was to gain an education, to gain knowledge. They would share that old saying that knowledge is power. Do y'all believe that today? That knowledge is power. Many of them, they would talk about the education that they wish they could get. And they would do that to encourage us, the younger generation, to not play around when it came to getting an education, to gain a knowledge. You see, they, they grew up at a time where they saw how knowledge was used to control others, to suppress others and in what they could do. They would say to us when we were little, once you gain that education, they would say that once you gain that knowledge, can't nobody ever take it away from you. That's what they would say. They would say that when you have learned something, when you have gained that knowledge, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can control you. They didn't want us to be controlled. Again, in the garden, Satan, he used his knowledge to control Eve, to control her, and to control Adam, and they fell in the garden. During the day of Jude, certain men, they used knowledge, their knowledge, to lead the folks, or that, that lack knowledge of Christ, to lead them away from Christ. I want you to understand that we are on a spiritual battlefield today. And on this battlefield, knowledge, it is the key. And listen to this. Knowledge is the key to whether you will live or die on this spiritual battlefield. And I'm not messing around when I say that. Knowledge is the key to whether or not you will spiritually live or die on this battlefield. And again, I don't know about you, but I want to live on spiritually. I don't want to spiritually die on this battlefield. Jesus, he said that if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. 
And then he said over in the eighth chapter of John's gospel, the 31st and the 32nd verse, if you want to write that down so you can see it later, he said that you shall know the truth. And I think many of us know this already. Jesus, he said that the truth, it will make you what? Oh, y'all kind of mumbled that. Y'all aren't confident in that. Oh, y'all just ain't paying attention to me. Y'all just sitting there just, it's just going in one ear and out the other ear. That's what, that's what y'all doing today. Jesus, he said that the truth, his truth, he said that if you know the truth, if you follow it, if it abides in you, he said that it will make you what? See, all other truths, they are either subjective or they are objective. Those truths can and they will change over time based on one's opinion or, or research data, if you will. But on the other hand, there is God's truth. God's truth, it is holy, it is righteous, and most importantly, it is unchanging. What was true of God is the same today as it was yesterday and will be tomorrow. And Jesus said that God's word is true. It will never pass away. This is something that is truly important for us to understand and to live by. The unchanging and freeing truth of the Lord our God. Because what was right yesterday is still right today in the eyes of God. And because you choose to live by it, again, I say to you today, you cannot be deceived. You who sincerely believe, you who have received the Holy Spirit, you have received the spirit of truth and you know the spirit of error. You know right from wrong and they can't no fool lead you astray because you have chosen to add knowledge to your faith. Important, valuable knowledge, not of the world, but knowledge of the Lord. My message today, it is one that is of true importance to me. And the reason why it goes back to my, my evaluation before I preach my, my first public sermon. You know, in evaluation, they ask, well, why, why do you want to preach? Is what they'll ask. And they say, well, the reason why I want to preach is because I was called to preach. You know, I, I was called to preach. I was called to preach. A long time ago, well before 2012, you know, when I was a little boy, they say, oh man, that's a pastor right there. I was called to preach when I was a little boy and I knew it myself and seemingly everybody around me, they knew it as well. So when they asked that question to me, I said, well, I'm fulfilling my calling. I was called to preach, but I didn't leave it at that. I told my committee, my evaluating committee, I told them that there is another reason why I desire to preach today. I told them that I was ordained. I was set forth by God to reach out to my generation, to today's generation with a message, with a word from God. What is that message? What is that word from God? Stop straying from the Lord. It is time for us to return to knowing the Lord our God today. We are strayed too far from God today. To the point that we are going blind to his word. To the point that we are going dark on his word. To the point that again we are headed in the direction of destruction. Rather than heading toward the light that is of the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you all today, but my path is directed towards the light. I'm walking in his light today. I'm walking towards the kingdom of heaven today. And I want the same for you and for all of those that are around us. I'm tired of seeing people being deceived by lying fools, by ignorant fools, people who like to profess that they are a child of God, but they don't come close to being a child of God. People who like to say that they worship their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but in their actions, in their activity, they are apostates. They don't follow him. They don't believe in him. They aren't walking according to his word. I desire for us to walk according to his word. I desire for us to know 
him today so that we aren't beaten, so that we aren't defeated by Satan and his agents of wickedness. It is time for us to know God today. It is time for us to know, to to know the Lord today. And the reason why is because, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God, it is at hand today. The kingdom of God today, it is closer than it has ever been. Yet at the same time, as the prophet Isaiah said, the mouth of Sheol, that is Hades, that is hell, it is opening its mouth beyond measure. And the reason why it's opening up its mouth so wide is because so many are going down that wide path. Y'all remember that sermon from earlier this year? When we lack knowledge of God, we are doomed to destruction. So as Jude concluded there in the 20th verse, we must build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Will you build yourself up on your most holy faith in the Lord today? I got one yes. Today, again, we must continue to add to our faith. We must keep on adding to our faith with goodness, with virtue, and we must do so with knowledge as well. When we grow in our knowledge, we come to realize that God loves us and that in his love, we are forever protected. We, again, we cannot be destroyed. We will overcome Satan. We will overcome the dangers, the threats that poses us today. We will overcome them and we will have the victory. Again, let us today, let us continue to keep growing in our faith. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications, so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.